John 1, we are up to verse 29, which means that we should be through this gospel, I don't know, in two or three years, at the, at the rate at which I go. Yes, we may be working our way slowly but surely through this gospel, but we do so because we don't want to be flippant or dismissive or uh, a great word that my old English um, theater pa professor used to use, slap dash. We don't, don't just want to look at it and then run on to the next. We want to bathe ourselves and immerse ourselves in its truth. And a reminder, again, at John 20, you're going to be tired of hearing this, John 20, 31, here's the whole reason that John writes this gospel. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is uh, an incredibly um, evangelistic book. And as people who are called to repeat this message, we dare not blast or tear our way through it. So, John 1. I'll back it up a bit because, as I say, we're looking at John has called his first witness. Um, he has made some very bold claims about who Christ is. And so that it's not just, oh, take my word for it. He's going to bring in other voices who said the same thing. So that by the time you come to that conclusion in chapter 20, there is an overwhelming and compelling weight of evidence for this claim that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that if you believe in that, you will have eternal life. There's an unspoken negative in that as well, because by the end of John 20, you have a choice to make. You believe or you don't. You repent or you don't. You are saved or you remain unsaved. And so because he wants to see people saved, he presents this incredibly compelling argument that is not just his word, as we say, but it is the word of many, many, many confirming others. So we come to the first of these figures, John the Baptist, who is... At Bethany by the Jordan, he is baptizing for the repentance of sins, and as we looked at last week in the few verses just before we come to this, around verse 20 and on, so many people have come out to see John that news has reached Jerusalem, and that means that it has reached the ears of the religious leaders in Jerusalem, namely the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the right-wing conservative branch in those days. And I think what upset them the most by the time the news reached them, is that John is baptizing. Baptizing, as we've looked at, is something that you did when you brought Gentiles into Israel. That if non-Jews came to faith, believed that there was one true living God, and that they wanted to serve and obey him, and therefore be amongst his people, you baptized people, you initiated them into Israel. And the baptism was one step in that process. Because they were filthy, sinful Gentiles, they had to be cleansed of their sins. But now news reaches them, and here's John, and he's doing it. But he's not doing it to Gentiles, he's doing it to Jews. And that's offensive, because if anybody is, or rather, if, if there's anyone who doesn't need to be cleansed, it's them. They, they have Abraham as their father. This is Department of Redundancy Department. And so people come out and they ask him, why are you, who, who are you? Why are you doing this? And then he says, he quotes Isaiah. He says, I am, uh, at verse 23, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. That's the uh, Pharisees were biblical experts. They didn't have to have that cross-referenced or explained to them, even though he does, as the prophet Isaiah said. So having no answers to their questions, they then come at verse 24 and ask him, basically, by what authority are you doing this thing then? If you are not the Christ, if you are not, one of the, if you are not Elijah, if you are not one of the promised other Old Testament figures that would have authority perhaps to do such a thing, by what authority are you doing? And notice he completely redirects, if you would. John answered them at verse 26. He answered them and says, I baptize with water. I'm just out here totally immersing people. Incidentally, they are going all the way down and all the way back up. I'm just out here baptizing with water. I'm not the one you should be seeking. The one you should be seeking stands among you. and You don't even know him. He comes after me, the strap of his sandal I am not worthy to untie. 
Verse 29, the next day, this is the second half of John's testimony, the next day he saw Jesus, this is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, quote from John, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this, this man to whom he is referring, that this is the Son of God. Close quote. End of John's testimony and corroborating statements. Lord add his blessing to that reading. So let's take a look at this this morning. This is the testimony, the continued I have in my notes, the continued testimony of John. I believe it was uh, the actor, I took a photo of it here, I believe it was the actor Jimmy Stewart. You know, Mr. Chips goes to Washington. Yeah, of course. I was going to say uh, the Christmas one, but everybody knows that one. Uh, apparently, uh, James Stewart used to say when they asked him about his philosophy or his approach to acting, he used to say, be yourself but also forget yourself. That is, be, when you're taking on an acting role, and I, a former actor, I can, I can unpack this for you, uh, that when you are, you have to be genuine. That is, the be yourself. You can only bring to a role really what you yourself have, but then also you have to leave yourself behind and take on your acting, your character, your persona. So be yourself, but also forget yourself. And this, um, this speaks about what John the Baptist is doing in this two-part testimony of his. Note that it starts with, I am not. If you go back up, here at the beginning of my role, I am not. They say, are you the Christ? I am not. Are you Elijah? I am not. I am not. I am not. And even when he does profess who he is, it's just, I am a voice. I am just out here making proclamation. And when they say and approach him about his baptism and say, well, then, by what authority are you baptizing? Why are you baptizing? He says, it's not even about my baptism. The first half of John's testimony about Christ is entirely deflective away from himself. And I want us to really take that to heart this morning. Myself, particularly. People should not leave the church saying, what an amazing preacher. That would just be my ego. What they should do is if they leave talking about the service at all, should be saying something much more akin to, what an amazing God was revealed to me this morning. We look away from ourselves. We look away from ourselves and towards Christ. This must be our true faithful, glorifying, edifying posture every Sunday. It's what we strive for. Sometimes we hit the mark better than others. But it should always be the mark at which we fire at. We look away from ourselves. We must decrease. He must increase. To bring in some other John the Baptist sayings about himself. This is reflected in, in every aspect of our worship here. It has to be, from the response of reading to the multiple passages of Scripture that we now go to, to the music that we bring and proclaim, to the message, to the prayer. It all has to be directed outward, not inward, because we have no power. We have no glory. But he has all power, and he is all glorious. And so John's model of Testimony is something that I just really wanted to highlight. It's in two parts, and the first part is, don't look at me. The second part is redirection. Look at him. Don't listen to me. Listen to his words. Don't say, I follow this particular pastor or this particular celebrity church leader. That would be a cult. 
say, I follow Christ, that's a church. So John's testimony in two parts begins with, I am not. Verses uh, chapter 1, 19 to 28, I am not. 29 to 34, he who truly baptizes, he says here, right? I'm just out here baptizing with water. These are, I'm not the one you should be looking at, and this is not the baptism you should be seeking. And I am not the baptizer you should be seeking. Because there is one who truly baptizes. And then it's John 3, chapter 3, 22 and 36, where we will hear that other summation. And this is, well, John is in prison. He's, in, he's rotting in prison under wrongful arrest. They come and say, people are, people are following Jesus. They're not following you. Well, before I go to jail, know this. He must increase. I must decrease. John has, in effect, told the investigating Pharisees what he is not so that he may point and redirect them to what is really important and who is really important. So, take a look at some of what we've got this morning. Because now we come to the, if, if the first half is his redirection, the I am not, then the second half is he is. And within that he is, there are two components, two general components in his, I guess let's call it his affirming testimony. He denies himself and he affirms Christ. So within his affirming testimony, John the Baptist breaks down, I think we can look in the text, at two, two basic things. This is he, as it's not about me, I'm going to point to Christ, and it's not about this baptism, I'm going to talk about the baptism that is really important. So we have these two parts. This is the one that you should seek, and this is the baptism that truly cleanses. Let's take a look at the first half. This is he. Well, verse 30. Jesus is greater than John because he is pre-existent. This is John. Uh, something else we will notice about John's gospel is that John loves wordplay. So, verse 30. Take a look at that. This is he of whom? This is John the Baptist pointing to Christ and saying, this is what I said yesterday. Remember yesterday I said there was one even among you the strap of his sandal I'm not worthy to untie. That's how amazing he is, how powerful he is. That's what kind of authority he has. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me. That is, in terms of social rank, this figure that you should be seeking is far above me. And the reason that he is far above me is because he existed before me. He is before me in terms of social status because he was before me in terms of existence. It's a bit of a, as I say, it's a bit of a stretch, a wordplay joke, but there's almost a, Jesus told the parables very specifically so that those with the Spirit would understand, those without the Spirit would not. And I suspect that John is doing much the same thing, that these Pharisees, these the paragons of godliness and righteousness in the land, they should understand this, and I'm fairly certain it goes right over their head. John, of course, if we read the, uh, the opening chapters of Luke, John and Jesus were related, very possibly cousins, and technically, in terms of birthdays, John was about six months older than Jesus, because his mother, Elizabeth, is pregnant for about six months when Mary first comes and says, this is what the angel has told me. So there is a six-month difference between John and Jesus, with John being the elder by six months. So if you just looked at this in terms of worldly birthdays or candles on cakes, John gets there first. John would therefore technically be before Christ in terms of age, in terms of authority, in terms of life experience, in terms of uh, education, or anything else. But John says, no, that is actually not what is important. Christ is before me because he was quite literally before me. So now we see John the Baptist is already beginning to back up John the Gospel writer's statement at 1-1, yes? In the beginning, that is before Genesis 1-1, and those words were spoken, before anyone said, let there be light, and there was light, before any of that, in the eternity past, as we say, there was Christ. There was the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing perfectly and in perfect union and community and in love with one another. 
And I say that because there are some out there who would tell you that the whole creation account, ourselves included as part of it, that God spoke those words and created us out of the dust because he was somehow lonely or incomplete. I, I just, let me clarify that. He was not. They were not. They were all complete, all self-sufficient. And in the beginning, Christ, as the Son, as the second person in the Trinity, was there. He was there an eternity before John the Baptist ever was born, let alone got down into the Jordan River. And so here, John begins his redirection. Yes, he, he begins his affirmation of Christ. He affirms his eternal deity, his eternal pre-existence before all of the creation. And that is why. He says, if you put a side by each, I am completely unworthy. I am completely unworthy to even undo the strap of his sandal, uh, that is, take off his muddy boots. It would have been the, the, the very lowest activity for a household slave. He says, I'm not even worthy to do that. So at verse 30, in redirecting towards Christ and pointing out Christ and elevating Christ, John says, I'm nobody. He's greater than me because he is preexistent. That is, he is God. At verse 32, this is very interesting. He then says, and remember I said last week, the, the baptism of Jesus at this point in the story has already happened. You can see that John refers to it in past tense. But when he did baptize Jesus, in order to fulfill all righteousness, in verse 32, John bears witness, so he recounts the story. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. This is in all of the other gospel accounts, that Jesus is baptized and then the heavens open, um, the spirit, like a dove, flutters down. I'm not sure what it actually looked like. I doubt it was an actual bird. But the spirit descends and rests on Christ, and it stays resting on him. And this is the evidence by which John says, this is the Son of God. This is he. It's the remaining that I have underlined here in my notes, and that maybe if you've got your Bible, you want to do the same, or your notebook, remained on him. That is, it is continuous. It's not going anywhere. It is not a temporary injection of the Holy Spirit. If you think about the Old Testament, particularly I'm thinking the book of Judges, uh, but all throughout Israel's history, you remember some of your, drag out some of your flannel gram Sunday school lessons of yesteryear. There are epic, heroic figures in Israel's history who are called upon to do amazing things, to rise above the crowd, particularly, I keep thinking, although he was a terrible example of Samson. Samson, who took the jawbone of a dead donkey and killed Philistines by the hundreds, thousands. Why? Because the Spirit came on him mightily, our text says. There are recurring figures upon whom the Spirit is suddenly injected, suddenly poured out upon, and they do huge, supernatural nigh miraculous works, and then the Spirit, having done what he needs to do, goes away. So there have been figures in the past on whom we could say the Spirit descended and came to rest. The important thing is that when the Spirit comes and descends and rests on Jesus, it remains. This is no mere man, in other words. This is not a Samson figure. This is not a Old Testament, perhaps one of the other, a Gideon or another judge-like figure. This is more than just a prophet, even. This is Messiah. Messiah will be anointed with the Holy Spirit, not just for a time, but for all time. The New Testament church would proclaim this again and again. Think of Acts 10.38. Explicitly, our text tells us that God anointed Jesus. But the language that I want to, just to get this home for you a little bit more, is actually in Isaiah. Three places in Isaiah. Um, start with Isaiah. You can either turn to it or make the note. I'll turn to it because that's my job. Isaiah 11. They're actually very all, once you find Isaiah, they are all easy to find. Once you, as I say, once you find Isaiah... The first one is Isaiah 11. Um, bear with me, because Isaiah is long. Isaiah 11, I'm going to show you three instances where the prophet Isaiah talks about the anointing. 
that Messiah, particularly the, the messianic figure that everyone has been waiting for, will be anointed with the Holy Spirit. Here's the first one, Isaiah 11. You've heard some of this before. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Who was Jesse? Oh, please. King David's father, right? Thank you very much. Thank you, right? So we're talking about the divinic lineage from whom we are awaiting Israel's true king. So we're looking and talking about the coming king. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Verse 2 is Isaiah 11, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It won't just be a temporary measure. It will come and it will stay on this figure and this figure alone. The coming Messiah in his office as king will be once and forever anointed with the Holy Spirit. You with me so far? Now, Isaiah 42. So the king will be anointed. So will the Lord's servant, Isaiah 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold. This is 42 verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. So the servant, the servant who is to come and suffer, will be anointed. The king who is to rule and inaugurate his kingdom will be anointed. And finally, I know you know these, Isaiah 61. Again, these, these are easy to find because they start, all start at the first verse. Isaiah 61, 1. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If that sounds familiar, that's because in Luke 4, that is what Jesus goes to the synagogue and reads, then sits down, and his entire commentary on that reading is, today this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, it's me. So the coming king, the coming servant, and this coming prophetic figure. Isaiah says all three of these offices, of these figures, these people, will be anointed permanently so, powerfully so, with the Holy Spirit. What Isaiah could only hint at and look for is revealed in Christ. All three of these people are actually Christ. It's all the same person. Uh, it's just him and his three offices as prophet, priest, and king. Anointed with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit comes and rests on him. This separates Christ. Hear me this morning. This separates Christ from every other messianic figure, not only in biblical history, but in world history. They cannot make this claim. They may dare, but they cannot truthfully make this claim that they were anointed once and forever, not like Jesus was. So, Jesus is greater than John because he's preexistent. Jesus is greater than John because, I mean, John is a spirit-filled man. He is the last of the Old Testament prophets. Don't, don't misunderstand. But his anointing with the Spirit doesn't even compare with Christ. And this is again affirmed, like really, if you don't want to take John the baptizer's word for it, or John the gospel writer's word for it, why don't we take God's word for it? Because John the Baptist quotes the Almighty here. Something, incidentally, only prophets could do. God speaks to John, affirming Jesus' identity before any of this happens. He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. God tells John the Baptist this before it happens. Then it happens. Reaffirming, confirming Jesus' identity as verse 34, the Son of God. And that, incidentally, is pretty much the end of John the Baptist's testimony because there's nothing else to say. You either believe that or you don't. And almost to a man, the Pharisees did not. 
So the first part that I wanted us to look at this morning in John's affirming testimony is his redirection. His redirection. This is he. This is the one you should be asking about. This is the one you should be seeking. And that goes for the Pharisees as well as for every man, woman, and child living in contemporary 21st century Canada. Don't be looking after heroic church figures. Be looking after Christ. Any church figure that's worth coming alongside is doing that to begin with, pointing you to him, not themselves. Here's the other half, that, uh, the other thing that John in his affirming testimony would have his hearers come to grapple with and understand, and I would have us do the same this morning. Christ is greater than John for all the reasons that we've looked at, and his baptism is greater than John's as well. John is just out here baptizing with water. He says it three times in this scene. At verse 26, I baptize with water. It's just water. People are just getting wet. In other words, there is no baptismal regeneration going on here. I'm, they're not going in sinners and coming up saints. It's just water. I baptize with water. What's happening is entirely symbolic. At verse 31, he reemphasizes this. I baptize with water. But now we have the reason. Why is he doing this? Again, to reveal Christ. What I'm doing is not the goal in and of itself. What I'm doing is storytelling. This is a metaphor. Those who are spiritually unclean are coming because they recognize I need to be cleansed. I need to be inaugurated into the new kingdom because I'm on the outside. What I need is Christ. You see, the whole baptism, and John says, I baptize just to point to Christ, to reveal your need for him. And thirdly, at verse 33, not even two, two verses later, I baptize with water. Three times. It's just water. It's just water. It's beautiful symbology, and it's absolutely necessary in order to fulfill all righteousness, but it's just water. As I said, baptismal regeneration is not happening here. Now, maybe some of you come from a different church background, maybe a higher church, Catholic, Anglican, anything like that, where this is something that is taught and upheld and espoused. That it's the actual baptism, the act of baptism itself is actually what is making you born again. No. No. No act of man gives a person the new birth. We're going to get to chapter 3, and we will look at that in great depth. But here, again, John in the first chapter is introducing things that will echo throughout the rest of the gospel. And here is one of these truths. If you're going to really be cleansed, you're going to need more than water. We looked at Psalm 51 earlier. Purge me with hyssop. I'll be clean. Hyssop, soap, right? You need soap, but not a kind of earthly soap. This is the, the picture that David is writing there. I need to be cleansed by God. And Dove, despite it having, you know, 99% moisturizers, isn't going to cleanse my soul. <laughs> Calgon, Ajax, can't get that deep. You can't scrub so hard that you give yourself a new heart. You can't rebirth yourself, right? You can't rebirth yourself. It is entirely a work of God. How do you change your own heart? Go on, think about it, tell me. How do you change your own heart? How do you, through any effort of your own, pluck out your dead, offensive to God, stony heart, and implant a brand new one of flesh, that is one that is open to receive his word, one that beats, one that no longer hates him but loves him, one that no longer flees into darkness but rushes to embrace and remain in the light? How do you do that? Don't give yourself an aneurysm, you can't. We'll come to see, this is what was tripping up Nicodemus. How can a man be born again? Well, Jesus says, listen, unless you're born again from above, that is, unless a work of God takes place in you and makes you a new person, you cannot even see the kingdom, let alone enter it. It's all of God. John the Baptist begins to introduce this concept here. It's just water. It's not magic. 
There's nothing happening here that's not symbolic. There's nothing happening here that is not intentionally pointing towards Christ. This is also, again, as we say, this is how we know that the baptism that John is doing here is rooted in the Old Testament. And it is not New Testament Christian baptism. By the way, we do have a baptistry back here. It's behind the screen. And I would dearly love to use it. But we baptize into Christ's death. And if you want to be baptized, I'll do it. I'll come and get wet with you. We'll fill that with water. And we'll get in there, and I will dunk you. I will dunk you. In fact, in early in Baptist history, did you know that we were referred to with a great amount of disdain as the dunkers? It's true, the dunkers. We don't sprinkle or splash. We took you, and we put you all the way down, and then hold you there for a little bit, and then we let you back up. Baptized into Christ's death, yes, Raised up into new life with him. What's happening is not the water. What's happening is we are using the water, we're using baptism to illustrate a theological reality that has already happened. I was dead. Let me go down into the grave as Christ did. Now I am alive. Let me be raised up, not by my own power, but by another. You see? The water didn't do anything. The Spirit has already done it. John says the same thing. It's just water. There's no baptismal regeneration. By an extension of that, the water really only cleanses the outside, doesn't it? The water's not cleansing the inside. But if you want to come into the kingdom, and if you want to serve the king, you need to be cleansed, not your skin, but your heart. You can't get water in there, well, and still live. You can't cleanse yourself. You must be cleansed from above. I baptize with water. Well, okay, that's great, Braden. How, how do I get a clean heart then? If I can't scrub myself clean, if I can't get there through works or anything, how do I get a clean heart? Well, it is what we call a monergistic work. Big seminary word. Simply means it is a singular mono work. Ergo, for God, gistic work of God. God does it in his own sweet time and in his own choice and in his own pleasure. Now, how does he do it? This is very interesting. So let's take a few minutes and talk about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The baptism with the Holy Spirit. So what we're talking about, if you're making notes and following along, this is the word that we need to know. Regeneration. Right? Regeneration. That is literally made entirely new all over again. The Christian life, coming to Christ, is not a matter of simply cleaning up a cluttered house. It is not, I'm going to get my life in order and get right with God. That works, and that will last maybe a little while, but it will collapse and fail. It is not... You want to think in terms, I always end up comparing it to those home renovation shows that are everywhere. It is not repainting. It is not refurbishing. It is a complete teardown and rebuilding. Regeneration. As I said, we'll come to this, a deeper exploration of this in John 3, in those verses 1 to 15, leading up to John 3, 16, about being born again. I'm not so old that I don't remember when we used to identify ourselves this way, yes? I'm born again. I've been born again. Are you a born again Christian? Which is a bit of a, honestly, when you think about it, a bit of a, again, department of redundancy department. All genuine Christians have been born again. And if you haven't been born again, you're not a genuine Christian. But it was a way of identifying ourselves. And for some reason, somehow, that dropped out of our common vernacular. We stopped identifying ourselves as that. We stopped asking, have you been born again? Again, just one of the many things that we need to get back at because it, it points to a very critical and real reality. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, we talk about regeneration. And John's saying, this is just water. It doesn't regenerate. You need to be regenerated. And regeneration comes from above. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Paul would clarify this in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. 
saying that uh, when a person comes to faith that Christ baptizes the believer with the Spirit into the body. That is, all genuine believers, all regenerate, born again, I once was this, but now I'm this, saved Christians are part of the church because they have been baptized by Christ with the Holy Spirit. If we were looking at 1 Corinthians, I mean, we could just camp on that for a whole week. That's an amazing reality. But in John 1, we have here, and I'll point out that it's expected. They fully expected this to happen. When Messiah comes, you've looked at Isaiah, the Spirit will be poured out on him, and he will likewise pour the Spirit out on others. And in verse 2, or Acts 2, I should say, when we come into the actual church age, this is experienced, starting at Pentecost and beyond. What is baptism in the Holy Spirit? Well, let me give you a bit of a, a wordy thing. It is a spiritual reality that occurs in every believer the moment one becomes a Christian and is placed by Christ into the body. That's basically breaking down what Paul wrote there in 1 Corinthians 12. It is a spiritual reality. That's why you can't do it yourself. It's a spiritual reality, a spiritual cleansing. Now, how does... We say, oh, okay, great, the Godhead regenerates. How? This is fascinating. You're going to like this. So we say that God the Father is the ultimate agent of regeneration. That is, he makes people new according to his time and his will. The Spirit is the cause of regeneration. That's what we're talking about here, being baptized with the Spirit. But the preached gospel is the means. It is the means of regeneration. The Father elects, the Spirit regenerates and sanctifies, but no one comes to faith unless they hear the gospel proclaimed. Nobody wakes up one morning out of the blue, never having cracked a Bible, and is born again. Because it is through the foolishness of preaching that God has ordained, people are to come to saving faith. That's a bit of a bold statement, so I want to give you a couple of scriptural proofs. Show your homework. Show your homework that the preached gospel is the means of regeneration. That's, that's how the Spirit works. James 1.18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. How were you made Christians, James says? How were you saved? How were you brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son by the word of truth? Someone told you the story of Jesus. You see now why we have such a deep and intense focus on our children? You think if you just, oh, they'll decide on their own when they're old enough. Yeah, they'll decide. They'll decide for one of a hundred different faiths. You need to lay a foundation. And that foundation must be the Bible. It must be the word of truth. Of his own will, of God's own will, he brought us forth from the kingdom of darkness, by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. Peter, John, James is not the only one who says this. 1 Peter 1, 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, you are now promised eternal life. You can't get that of your own works. You've been born again through the living and abiding word of God. Somewhere in your past, Christian, you came to faith, you came to conviction, you came to belief because of what you were told, maybe repeatedly, <laughs> because of what you were told about Christ. And then one day the Spirit moved, regenerated you, and it all fell into place. Joyfully, for me, it was like a hammer blow of conviction. Your mileage may vary. But if no one had opened or preached the Bible to me, it wouldn't have happened. Peter says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The same message that brought people to saving faith in Acts 2 is the same message that has and will bring people to saving faith here in Ajax. So if you are a minister or an evangelist, don't you dare tinker 
with the word. This is this word, Peter sum summarizes, is the good news that was preached to you. You came to saving faith because you heard the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, to this he called you through our gospel. Thank you very much, Paul. How were you called? How were you called to repent and believe? By the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 17, so faith, here's, here's where it really comes to me. So faith comes by hearing. And hearing, any old thing? No. Hearing through the word of Christ. And then I actually wanted to turn to this one, Romans 1. Romans 1, 16. In fact, I probably shouldn't even need to turn to it, but Romans 1, 16, writing that the righteous shall live by faith. Paul says this. You want a, you want a memorization verse for the week? Here it is. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation for all, KGV, who believeth. It is the power of God. No one comes to saving faith by hearing anything other than the good news. Therefore, preachers, myself included, preach the good news. Christians, when you go out to evangelize, tell them the good news of salvation and remind them what it is if they need to hear it, and they need to hear it. What they need to be saved from. Destroy the common argument. Destroy it, because it imprisons people. Destroy the common argument that I'm a pretty good person. I'm sure the good in my life outweighs the bad, and God's loving and forgiving, and I'm sure I'll cross the finish line somehow. You know it's out there. You've heard it. At some time, I'm sure many of us labored under it. God is good, right? Well, if he exists, let's add that into the pot. If God exists and he's really so good and loving, how could he possibly condemn me? It betrays a gross misunderstanding of sin. You have to show the bad news. The bad news is what makes the good news all the better. You have to preach a whole gospel. And then, like John 20, people will be left with a choice. Believe it or don't. Come to salvation, remain dead in your sins. So, just to clarify, it is the Father who is what we say the agent God chooses who is going to be regenerated, and when the Spirit does the actual regenerating, but people have to hear it. The gospel, the preached gospel, is what we call the means of regeneration. What are the results of regeneration, of the baptism that truly cleanses? How do you know it's really happened? Well, I'll give you this from 2 Corinthians 4, 6. You are repulsed by sin. You're repulsed by it. Doesn't mean you don't still do it. We're none of us perfect yet. Someday we will be entirely delivered from it. That's what we look forward to. But from between now and then, we will be repulsed by it. Even Paul, Romans 7, uh, there are things that I know I should do and I don't. There are things that I shouldn't do and I do. Wretched man that I am, he says. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I am repulsed by the sin that remains in me. I strive, this is the Christian walk, I strive not to indulge it. When its siren call comes from up out of my heart or from outside me, in music or entertainments over the internet, wherever it comes in, when it calls, hey, you, come, sin, do what God says, do not. I have to work then to actively, John Owen, the Puritan writer John Owen put it this way, mortify, I must kill it to cut off the sin in my life. Why? Because it is repulsive to me. Why should it be repulsive to the genuinely spirit-baptized Christian? Because it's repulsive to the Lord. We are baptized now into him. Yes, Christian, you are baptized into Christ, into his body, by the Holy Spirit. That means you love what he loves. You hate what he hates. He hates your sin. His holiness demands that he hates sin. And so if people wear the label of, oh, I'm a Christian, but then embrace all kinds of sinful behavior, no matter what it may be, that speaks volumes, doesn't it, as to the genuineness 
of their washing. The results of regeneration are a revulsion of sin at the same time being drawn to Christ. I want to be like Jesus. Unregenerate sinful people don't want this at all. They don't want to be like Jesus. Not like he really is. They'll usually hold up a kind of um, elaborate thinking of who Jesus is and then go, this is what we should be. It's not the real Jesus. Because the real Jesus calls for denial of self, picking up a cross, and following after him. The real Jesus calls for obedience to him. The real Jesus calls us to a life of holiness. And unregenerate people, that's the last thing they want. Our genuine sanctification makes us sick of sin and draws us to Christ. And in so doing, this is how you can tell who's real and who's just wearing a name tag sticker label. Those who are genuinely regenerated make a practice of righteousness. I seek to do that which is pleasing to God. Do I always do it? Probably not. But the striving is what defines the Christian walk, the striving as well as the putting aside. And this was what John is testifying to. I am not the Christ. I am not any of these great expected prophetic figures. I'm just a voice. You see the connection now? I am calling people. I am giving them the good news. I am pointing them to Christ. If I just stay out here in the Judean wilderness and don't say a word, they won't hear. If they don't hear, they won't hear. Be convicted. If they're not convicted, they will not repent. If they don't repent, they will not call out. If they don't call out, they won't be saved. It's the whole inverse logic that Paul presents there in Romans 10. How will they hear? Those who hear will be saved, right? Those who hear will call out. They'll call out on the name of the Lord and be saved. Well, how will they do any of that if they don't hear? How will they even hear unless there's a preacher? And that preacher better be preaching the gospel good news. Well, that's exactly what John is doing. Listen, if you're going to call me anything, John says, I'm just the messenger. I'm just the voice. What you need to really be listening for, seeking and paying attention to, is the message. And the message is, he who is greater than me, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, that is, he who was the preexistent second person in the Godhead now stands incarnate in your midst. And he doesn't baptize with a water that will just cleanse the outside or he's give you a baptism that is a beautiful metaphor. He will genuinely restore your soul. So look to him. How is it that Christ is even able to do this? Because he and he alone is, verse 34, the Son of God. And as much as I wanted to move on to the third day where Jesus begins to call his disciples, next week I think that we are going to do a biblical survey of those three words. What does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? And I certainly hope that I'll see you here in seven days. And I'll try to have something for you. Let's come to a word of prayer before we come to the table. God, our Heavenly Father, this amazing truth and reality presented to us here, this second half of John's testimony, let it be our testimony. Let us always redirect away from ourselves and towards Christ. When brothers and sisters come alongside looking for edification or building up, yes, let us be there for them, but let us collectively then look to Christ. In our evangelistic efforts, let us always be pointing towards Christ. In our lives, let us always be showing Christ, never self-inflating, but always denying self. Let us be reduced so that his glory may rise above and be seen and known. And for myself and all other preachers occupying pulpits across this land, Father God, My prayer this morning is that we would be ever true, that you would stifle in us all words of falseness or self-aggrandizement, that we would never make the church about the pastor or about the sermon, but always about the subject and the founder. 
that all of our efforts from every pulpit in the land would direct towards Christ, would turn the people's hearts to Christ, their ears to Christ, their eyes to Christ, that they would bend the knee, repent, and come to saving faith, or if they already be counted among the redeemed, that they would bend the knee and with joyous expression proclaim the name that is above all names, no other name given unto man by which salvation has come. Let us be gospel-centered and gospel-affirming, for it and it alone, as Paul wrote in Romans, is the power of God unto salvation. No other message brings people to Christ, and therefore let no other message be the hallmark of our ministries or escape even our lips. As we prepare our hearts to come to the table, our prayer is that you would reaffirm and strengthen in us the magnificent atoning work that Christ did upon the cross of Calvary to ransom sinners to you, to stand in our place, to purchase us through his shed blood and clothe us not with a righteousness of our own but with his so that we may no longer stand ashamed and outside, but we may be kingdom citizens bathing and basking in your glory. We pray all of this in the Savior's name.